for coming to my defense today, either in person or remotely, especially at this very difficult time and under this very challenging situation. Today I'm going to talk about an experimental mathematics approach to several computatorial problems. So here's the content. First, uh, I'll talk about what is experimental mathematics. Then we'll begin with parking functions. We'll look at the golden knot of the C5 ansatz. Then we'll use experimental mathematics to do the analysis of quicksort algorithms. And finally, we will look at Peter Bokrin's problem. Then I will have the summary. OK, so what is experimental mathematics? It is an experimental approach to mathematics in which programming and symbolic computation are used to investigate mathematical objects, identify properties and patterns, discover facts and formulas, and even automatically prove theorems. So here is a map of continental USA, colored with four colors. So we know that in the proof of four color theorem, uh, computers were used to check the more than 1,000 reducible configurations. So without computers, the proof might be impossible. And here are some advantages of the experimental mathematics approach. Uh, it is efficient because we know computers can calculate much faster than humans. Uh, it can be easier, uh, it can be automatic, and computers are very powerful. It is less error prone. Uh, usually humans make more mistakes than computers. It is tireless. Computers do not need to uh, sleep or eat or drink and they are much more beyond. So I'd like to compare experimental mathematics with machine learning. As we know that a machine learning today revolutionized information technology, it can do what humans can. So for example, humans can distinguish on a photo whether it's a cat or dog. And with machine learning, we just need to analyze the data. We look at a pixel. So for each picture, it will be like three matrices. On each matrices, it's just the numbers from, uh, say, 0 to 255. Then from this data, machine learning can distinguish whether it is a picture of a cat or a dog. It can do better than humans. For example, in the game Go, uh, AlphaGo, which are built by deep learning, uh, can beat human world champions. And it can do what humans can't do or what takes too long to do. Uh, for example, detect financial fraud for millions of users or even billions of users. Uh, the recommended system for each user, online search, and find patterns from big data. So just as machine learning revolutionized information technology, experimental mathematics revolutionized mathematics. It can look for pattern, test the conjecture, utilize data to make a discovery, prove this automatically, provide better tools to maintain and continue building the mathematical stats ripper. Um, can I say something? You yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, then we begin with parking functions. So here is a map of Hill Center. The blue dot is where we are now. And let's assume in a parallel universe, Freedom Hansen Road is a one-way street say from east to west. And there are several parking spaces, say N, on the southern side of the hill center. And at the beginning of the day, all the spaces are available. Then N cars come to park one by one. Each car I has in its favorite parking space, number AI. So each car will always go to its favorite parking space first, and then to see what is available. If it is, it will park there. If it's not, it will try to park at the next available parking space. So if all cars can park, we call the preference factor a parking function. So are they parking functions? Uh, the first one is a permutation of nine. So it means each car has different favorite parking space. So definitely all cars can park. The same for one, two, three, three, two, one. And for two, two, one, the first car parks at two, the second car parks at three. The last car will park at one. But if it's two to two, then it's not a parking function because after the first two cars park at two and three, the third car will not be able to park. 
So here is a formal definition uh, of parking functions of vector of positive integers uh, from P1 to Pn with each Pi from 1 to n. It's a parking function if its non-decreasing social version satisfies the i-th element is no more than i. Because not all cars can park if and only if too many cars prefer a large number parking space. So this criteria can guarantee all cars can park. So naturally, we'd like to ask how many parking substitutions are there for length n? So the number is n plus 1 to n minus 1. Uh, and there is a very classical proof. Let's arrange n plus 1 parking space in a circle. Then n cars come to park. Now, each car can still choose uh, n plus 1 as their favorite parking space. So totally, we have n plus 1 to the n preference vectors. And in this case, we claim that if n plus 1 is the empty space, then it's a parking function. Because definitely all cars can park, and there will be one empty space. So let's say uh, if the preference vector is a1, a2 up to an, then the empty space is j. Now let's consider a1 plus i, a2 plus i, up to an plus i, so each number is mod n plus 1. In this case, the empty space will be j plus i mod n plus 1. So it's just a rotation. So uh, in this case, we consider i ranges over 0 to n. And in this n plus 1 parking of preference vectors, exactly one of them is a parking function. So the answer is n plus 1 to the n divided by n plus 1, which is n plus 1 to n minus 1. And here are some generalizations of parking functions. Uh, for example, k hat parking function. So in this one, uh, after we sort in them, the i element should be no more than ki. And in this case, we can write this k hat parking function as k times an ordinary parking function minus a sequence r1 up to rn, if r i is from 0 to k minus 1. So totally, the number is k to the n times n plus 1 to n minus 1. And more generally, we can have a x vector parking function. So in this case, obviously the number depends on uh, the vector. But our focus is the next one, which is called a parking function. So a vector uh, is an a parking function if it's non-decreasing solid version satisfies that the i-th element is no more than a plus i minus 1. So when a is 1, it, it is just as a usual parking function I mentioned. And we will focus on a parking functions because from a parking functions, we can have our experimental mathematics motivated proof of the number of parking functions. So if we let C of n a be the number of sorted a parking functions of less n, then we have this recurrence relation because we just need to consider the number of ones. If there are k ones, then we delete them. And we consider a k plus 1 uh, minus 1 up to a n minus 1. So this is an a plus k minus 1 parking function of less n minus k. So similarly, if it PNA is a number of a parking function, we still consider the number of ones. But in this case, if there are k ones, we need to consider the location. So in the recursive relation, we have uh, the extra term n choose k. So now, with experimental mathematics and the maple programming, we have get a result. So from this one, we can conjecture P of n a equals to a times a plus n to the n minus 1. So we want to prove it. Uh, we can prove by induction. So first, check the initial condition. Then by induction, we just need to pr prove this identity. So we define the function uh, f of x. Then basically, what we need is a binomial theorem, uh, because in, on this line, we use the binomial theorem. 
then we plug in uh, s equals to a plus n minus 1, then uh, we get the number for a parking substance. And when a equals to 1, this is exactly n plus 1 to n minus 1. And now uh, we look at another computatorial object labeled rooted storage. So uh, we can see the labeled rooted storage with A components, where the loops are from 1 to A. And the total number of vertices are A plus N. So we let T of NA denote the number of such storage. Then first we check the initial condition. They are exactly the same uh, with P of NA. Then we consider the number of neighbors of the vertex 1. We remove them with their subtrees and delete the vertex 1. So in this case, there are a plus k minus 1 components and n minus k non loop vertices. So hence, we have uh, the same recurrence relation. So from this, we can see t of n a equals to p of n a. So since their numbers are the same, naturally there are lots of bijections from them. So we discover or possibly rediscover bijection. Uh, this bijection can be best demonstrated by examples. So let's consider a two parking function of less seven, uh, 5, 8, 4, 2, 1, 2, 1. So we use a two-line notation. The first line is the uh, vertices. So actually, there are non loose vertices, so it's from 3 to 9, because the 1 and the 2 are the loose. The second line is our two parking function. So we sort the second line, and now we want to interpret the second two line notation. Our interpretation is that the parent of vertices 3 and 4 is 1, because you can see here is 3 and 4, and the second line is 1. So 1 is their parent. Similarly, 2 is a parent of 5 and 6. So that's how we have this forest. But we are not done yet. This forest is for the two-line notation uh, after sorting the second line. So if when we sort the second line, we, uh, we also move the first line's elements accordingly. Then actually we will have this two-line notation. We compare this with the previous one then uh, we have a map from 3 to 9 to 3 to 9 itself. So what we need to do is just uh, do this transformation on this forest. Then we will have our label of rooted forest. So what we want to do is map this forest back to this two parking function. So here we need a convention. When we draw the forest for the same parent, we always place its children in an increasing order uh, from left to right. And we want to index each vertex. So the rule is we start from the first level, uh, which is a root, and then also start from left to right. So uh, we have this uh, indexing. Uh, that's from the top, right, left, one, two, three, four, five, six. Then we want to interpret this forest our interpretation is that uh, the first line is still the vertices 3 to 9, and for the second line, it should be the index of its parent. So for example, for 3, 3 here, you can see the parent of 3 is 6, the index of 6 is 5, so it should be 5, so here, this is 5. So similarly for 4, the parent of 4 is 3, but the index is 8, so here, this is 8. And then we want to talk about statistics. Uh, we can define some statistics in question uh, on some discrete set. So, uh, and also, we want to talk about the limiting distribution. So in this part, our focus is the sum and area statistics of a parking function. So for the statistics sum, it's uh, very easy to understand. We just add up all the elements in the parking function. And another one is called area, uh, which is defined as false. So uh, the reason we call it area uh, is because it is connected to the, the Browning excursion. So I'll show it uh, in a minute. Then we can define a PMA of x and a QMA of x. 
They are just a weighted analog of uh, P of N A. And then uh, similarly, we can get a recurrence relation uh, for P N A of X and Q N A of X. Uh, then uh, from P N A of X, we can get the formula for the expectation of the sum. Uh, actually, this result is, was obtained uh, by, I think, it's already obtained by someone else. Uh, but let's look at the summation here. Since summation uh, is connected to the sequence in OEIS, A435, this is expectation of the sum of the highs on labeled rooted trees on own vertices. And this, this was the first sequence uh, in OEIS. And the limited distribution of the area uh, is area distribution, and it's already proved. And the reason why it's called uh, area, so this one is called area statistic, is because, uh, sorry, let me choose a histogram first, then the skill distribution of the area. Because it's connected with the area under the Brown excursion. So Brown excursion is that that's a Brown motion uh, starts with starts from zero, the origin, and then we condition on that it arrives at one zero, and also between zero and one, it always stay above x axis. So we condition on this, then we consider the area below this uh, Brown excursion. The distribution of this is called, actually it's called area IRA distribution. There are many types of IRA distribution. We also have map IRA, and then we also have a Tracy Whedon IRA distribution. And surprisingly, uh, IRA distribution occurs in many seemingly unrelated problems, mostly in computer science and rock theory. So we just saw that it occurs in parking junction, it also occurs in a uh, random planar map. And then uh, we want to consider exact expression for the factorial moment. Uh, we want to express the factorial moment in terms of a polynomial AK of NA and another polynomial BK of NA. And then it should be AK of NA plus BK of NA times the expectation. So we get these results, uh, the second factorial moment, the third factorial moment, uh, the fourth one, fifth one, sixth one. And then uh, let's talk about C finite answers. Uh, this one shows the methodology of experimental mathematics. So what is a golden knot? Uh, once upon a time, there was a knot that no one could untangle. It was so complicated. Then came Alexander's bridge, and in one step, cut it with his sword. So it means there are some problems which might be very difficult for human approach, but if we can use experimental mathematics, it can be much easier. So in this part, uh, we will describe two case studies. Uh, in these two case studies, we know that the generating function should be rational, and it is easy to bound the degree of the denominator. So then we can just get um, many data, and then uh, we can split in a recurrence relation. And C finite means uh, if a sequence satisfies a linear recurrence relation with constant coefficients, so Fibonacci sequence is C finite. And a sequence is C finite if and only if its ordinary generating function is a rational function. So a Fibonacci sequence has a rational function as its generating function. And the definition for grid graphs, uh, because first we want to consider the number of standing trees on a grid graph. So it's just a, a, a natural definition. Then uh, in a human approach, we want to consider transform matrix. 
So for transform matrix, it means we need to have ordering uh, for all kinds of the forest. So in this case, we want to have some like, bijection from set partition to the forest. So we want to define the ordering on a set partition. If we have two set partitions, first we compare the number of paths. So the one with fewer paths will come first. And if they have the same number of paths, then uh, we consider uh, each fi, it means a block containing i. We find the first one which are not the same. Then we consider the normal graphical, graphical order on uh, fj and yj. j is the first one which are not the same. So uh, this is a partition uh, for, for three, one, two, three. And here is the uh, ordering. And uh, here are some additional definitions. So if uh, i and j are in the same block, it is equivalent that the vertices of v and i and v and j are in the same component of the spanning forest f. And we say uh, forest f and the set partition p uh, are consistent if the number of trees in F is precisely the number of paths in the partition P. And P is a partition induced by F. And now we consider the transform matrix. So basically, we consider the edges which are in GK of N, which is a K by N growth graph, but not in GK of N minus 1, which is K by N minus 1 growth graph. So in this set EN, there are two K minus 1 members. We want to consider uh, for how many subsets of EN can transfer some kind of uh, forest in the graph GK of N minus 1 to another kind of forest in the world graph GK of N. And then for the transfer matrix, we define the IJ entry uh, to be the number of sets which can transfer uh, Pj, which is uh, the forest consistent with the J's partition uh, to Pi. So we have some examples of the transfer matrices. You can see that when K increases, the dimension of the transfer matrix increases very fast. So with transform matrices, uh, actually uh, we need to do a, a lot of human work. But uh, with a famous zero on the next page, we are able to find the immune data easily. And then we can get a recurrence relation from the data. So this method will be um, easier than the transform matrix method. And from this one, we can get more results, actually. So the matrix is getting uh, if A is a legitimacy matrix of an arbitrary graph G, then the number of spanning trees is equal to a determinant of any cofactor of the Laplacian matrix, matrix L of G. So we just need to take the n comma n cofactor, then the determinant is the number of spanning trees of G. So uh, we have some maple procedure. Guess the rack is used to guess a conjecture the linear recursive relation from a list of numbers. Uh, C2i is also a procedure which accepts a recursive relation and outputs a generating function. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, Yuka. I have a question about guess recurrence. Yeah. Why, why didn't you use GFUN? What's that? GFUN is a standard label package. GFUN by Zimmerman and Salfi. Yeah, 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 yeah. We know about it. But we prefer to have a more open one. Why? Why? It's my question. Why do you not use GFUN? Oh, okay. because it's much better to do your own with more flexible. And in equity, that yes, I mean in Libya, in that in the Hyperba, so it's much easier you know, to so I can go. But you're right, we could we could have used it, but yeah. it's not, as you know, it's based on pattern approximations. Yes, thanks, thanks for information. 
Yeah, but uh, do you use Pate approximation? Um, no, basically I did all the programming uh, myself. Yeah, essentially, essentially we did, but yeah, we have our own package. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'll continue. So the general idea is to have a low enough list of data uh, for the number of spending trees in the k by n word graph. So here k is fixed, and n can go to infinity. Then uh, we use guesswork to get a recursion relation from the list of data. We will use C2R to find a generating function for the recursion relation. Then, with a the generating function, it is easy to get the number of spending trees in GK of n, even for very large n, say like 5 by 1 billion uh, world graph. So, this is much faster than calculating the determinant of the cofactor of the Laplacian matrix for large n. And since the number of states of a world graph is finite for fixed k, the number of spending trees for different n are a C finite sequence. So its generating function must be a unique rational function, hence our result is rigorous. So here are some generating functions. So you can notice that it since the degree of the denominator is 2 to k minus 1, Uh, we believe uh, this one is a new result, G7 of n, but uh, surprisingly, in this one, the degree of denominator is 48 instead of 64. And more importantly, we can consider an arbitrary graph G, and we consider the number of spending trees in a G times Pn. So Pn is just a pass. So uh, we also did this for like a cycle, a three cycle, or four cycle times Pn. Uh, and then we can also consider the statistic of the number of vertical edges. So we will have a bivariate generating function. So it's very similar. The general idea is that we need to replace some negative one in the Laplacian matrix by negative v, then we recalculate the diagonal elements. So here are some uh, bivariate generating function. Uh, then we'd like to consider almost diagonal matrices. So here, uh, almost diagonal is somewhat uh, a little bit different from the usual definition. So I'll show you in a minute. So the definition of diagonal matrices are the same, but here the almost diagonal matrix means if an entry is very far from the main diagonal, it should be zero. And if we have two entries, uh, say ai1, j1, and ai2, j2, if the difference between i1, j1 is the same as the difference between i2, j2, then ai1, j1 should be equal to ai2, j2. So here is our data structure. Uh, we have a list of three elements. The first one is the dimension. The second one is the non-zero elements in the first row. The third one is the non-zero elements in the first column. So uh, we have our uh, procedure. This one is to calculate the joint function for the determinant. So this is example. If the first row is two three and the first column two four five, and there's another approach which is uh, called a symbolic dynamical programming approach. Uh, so in this one, we use cofactor expansion. So from cofactor expansion, we can get a lot of let's say a spin S. In the spin, there will be we call the elements the children of the matrix. So first we use expand matrix L to do a one-step cofactor extension along the first row. Then we use uh, another method procedure, children matrix L, to find all children of an almost diagonal matrix. 
And after all children are found, we have a spin S. Then by the cofact extension of any element in a spin, a system of algebra equation follows. Then we just need to solve the system of equations to get the generating function. So here are our procedures. And here's the example. Okay, then uh, let's use experimental mathematics to do analysis of quick sort algorithms. So uh, sorting algorithms are very important in computer science and technology industry. There are many different sorting algorithms. Uh, quick sort this is the one we will focus today. And much sort, uh, basically it means we break it down the list to length of at most two. Then when the length of two is easy to solve them. Then we combine the sub list to the main list. During the combination process, we do the sorting. Uh, we also have bubble sort, inserting sort, selection sort. Uh, their complexity is bigger all of n square, so they are not very efficient when n is very large. Uh, and quick sort is the most widely used sorting algorithm. Uh, we need to randomly choose an element as a pivot. So in this picture, we choose three as a pivot. Then we compare each element with a pivot. If the element is smaller than pivot, we put it on the left side of the pivot. If it is greater than the pivot, we put it on the right side of the pivot. Then for the two sublists, we do this again. So recursively, uh, we can do the sorting. And uh, so far, very little research has been focusing on the explicit formula of the performance and the higher moments of crystal algorithms. Uh, it seems only explicit formulas for expectation and the variance are proven, previously known by a very complicated human approach. And the higher moments seem to be inaccessible by a human approach. Uh, so it is easier to consider the number of comparisons of quick sort because it, it is independent of the implementation. Basically, quick sort is an idea. It only tells we need to do the partition step, but it doesn't say how we will do that. So if we define uh, Cn be the random variable, the number of comparisons, and a little Cn is expectation, we have this recurrence relation uh, for little Cn. So we define uh, fk of n to be this dimension. And our educated guess that the moment should be a multivariate polynomial involving n, h1 of n up to hn of n, for n, and n depends on the order of the moment. So here are some of formal known results. This variance. This is a third moment, and this one is fourth moment. So uh, we don't have to consider the number of swaps instead of comparisons. So number of swaps is much more complicated than the number of comparisons because it's dependent on the specific variant, and it is also more significant because usually a swap takes more time and more computing resources than a comparison. So we have a several variants here. So the first one is variant nulla. It's just a, uh, as the one I mentioned. Every time we can create a new list, L1 and L2. L1 contains all elements which are no more than a pivot. L2 contains all elements which are greater than a pivot. So in this case, actually, there's no swap involved. But because we need to create a new, use new memory to create a new list, this is not space efficient, and it is also not time efficient. Uh, then we have variant one. In this one, we choose the first or equivalent the last element in the list of lens n as a pivot. Then we compare the other elements with a pivot. So we compare the second element with a pivot first. If it creates a pivot, it stays where it is. Otherwise, we insert it before the pivot. 
So this is uh, somewhat different from the traditional swap, but we define this operation as a swap. So generally, every time we find an element smaller than the pivot, we insert it before the pivot. So uh, we define this probability generating function. And then we have the recursive relation because we know that if the pivot is a case smallest, then uh, we will have k minus 1 swap. And divided by n because for each k uh, from 1 to n is equal like n. Then from this recursive relation, uh, we can get the expectation uh, variance third moment uh, and the fourth moment. So we want to uh, improve it a little bit. Uh, the seventh variant is similar to the first one. Uh, one tiny difference that instead of choosing the first or last element as a pivot, the index of a pivot is chosen uniformly at random. So for example, we can choose the ith element, which is the uh, case smallest as a pivot. Then we compare those non-pivot elements with a pivot. So if i is not equal to 1, then we compare the first element with a pivot. If it is smaller than a pivot, it stays there. Otherwise, it doesn't move to the end of the list. Then, after we compare all the left side elements with a pivot, we look at those elements whose index are originally greater than i. If they are greater than a pivot, no swap occurs. Otherwise, we insert them before the pivot. So, uh, in this one, we need uh, another function, q of nkit, with a probability generating function of the number of swaps in the first partition step. So here, the length is n, uh, the, the pivot is the i element, and it is a case smallest. t is a symbol. So uh, the number of swaps actually equals to the number of elements which are before k and greater than k, or after k and smaller than k. So if there are j elements which are before k and smaller than k, then we can get a number of swaps. We can also get the range of j. So this is a formula uh, for q of nkit. Uh, it looks like a very complicated summation. And then uh, we can get uh, the recursive relation for pn of t. So here we have a double sum because it depends on i and k. Then totally there are n square cases. And each situation is equal like this, so divided by n square. So then uh, we have expectation. You can notice that expectation is the same. But actually, this variance is smaller than the previous one. Here, you can notice for the variance, the leading term is 2n squared. But here is 11 over 6n squared. It means by choosing the pivot, uh, uniformly rendered, I mean, the, not only the value, but also the location. We can have a more consistent performance because the variance is smaller. Then, uh, third moment and fourth moment. Then, uh, we have variable theory. Uh, this one is the most used version. It's called the in-place quick sort. So it means in this one, we don't need to create any new list. We don't need any new memory. Uh, we do the swap uh, in the list itself. So basically, we need two pointers, i and j. So the index starts from 1. So first, i should be 0. Every time we find an element array j, which is no more than a pivot, then we increment i by 1. Then here, this step, we do the swap. And after the loop, uh, we do the swap again. Because the last one is a pivot. Then this step is just the, the recursion. So uh, in this case, we have the 
returns a relation for the probability generating function uh, when its k is smallest, they will be k swaps. So uh, we get uh, this results, expectation, variance. Uh, but there's some waste in variance three. So we want to improve it. So in variance four, every time when the element uh, A of J is no more than a pivot, actually we don't need to swap A I and A J if they have the same depth. So we want to modify the algorithm such that a swap is performed only when the index are different. So uh, here, y n of k will be the number of swaps in the first partition step in the in-place quicksort without swapping the same index. So when k equals n, actually we don't get any swap. When k less than n, then a swap occurs, of course, only when the element is less than pivot. But we also require, before i, there's already some element which is greater than pivot. Because of this, these two index will be different. Otherwise, the two pointers will be the same. So when k is n, the probability that there are s swaps will be uh, this formula. Because we just need to consider what is the location uh, of the first element, which is greater than the pivot. Then we can get this one. So now uh, we have a probability joint function for the one step, which is uh, Q of NKT. Then uh, we get the recursive relation for PN of T. So we also have expectation uh, and the variance. So for expectation, you can see this is indeed better than the first one, uh, because here we have one term n log n. So this one is actually log n. So it's the same here, n log n. But here, the coefficient of n is minus 4 over 3. But this one is minus 5 over 2. So this one has a, a better performance. Then we have variance 5. Uh, this one might not be practical, but we find it interesting as a combinatorial model. Because in quick thought, if we can choose an element which is closer to the median uh, as a pivot, then the performance will be better than average. So if there's additional information so that we can choose a pivot, uh, not uniformly, but maybe something like Gaussian, so it is to our advantage. So let's assume uh, the list is already a permutation of n, but of course we pretend not knowing that the sorted list is uh, from 1 to n. So now the rule is that we choose the first and the last number in the list. We look at the numbers and choose the one which is closer to the median. If they are equally likely, equal close to the median, then we choose the one at the random. So this process uh, makes the distribution uh, of all elements different. It means if it's closer to the median, you will have a higher probability to choose an element as a pivot. And this can improve the performance. So here we get the probability uh, to choose each element uh, as a pivot. Then uh, we have this return relation. Uh, and for this one, it seems difficult to get the explicit formula. Uh, so uh, we have this return relation for the expectation of the number of swaps. Here, n is a, a shift operator. And then uh, we consider dual pivot quick sort. We consider the number of comparisons of dual pivot quick sort. So we also get uh, this return relation. And we have expectation, variance, third moment, and fourth moment. So that's something surprising. For so dual pivot quick sort, the expectation up to fourth moment has the same explicit formula with one pivot quick sort. So how about number of slots? So again, it depends on the implementation. So we do an analog of variable one. So now let's consider 
uh, the first and the last elements uh, as a pivot. So when there are two pivots in the situation, let's say that I and J, if I greater than J, then we we'll swap them and we'll still call a smaller one I. So each time, if there's an element less than I, we move it to the left of I. And if an element greater than J, we move it to the right of J. And we call this kind of operation as a swap. Then uh, we have our, our recurrence relation, and we get expectation. So we can see that in this one, the n log n has coefficient of four fifths, which is better than one pivot quick sort. So how about three pivot quick sort? So now there are more things to be defined. For example, how to sort a pivot? Uh, we can use one pivot quick sort to sort a pivot. How to partition the list? Uh, because now it's three pivot, it means there will be four sublists. So luckily we can use binary search. And how to start a list or sublist containing less than three elements, we can also use one pivot quick sort. So again, we get a recursive relation, uh, and then we have a, we have a recursive relation for the expected number of comparisons uh, in the three pivot quick sort. And more generally, for k pivot quick start, the conclusion is that if we have a long enough list, say n goes to infinity, then the more pivots, the better. It means, say, if we have five pivot quick start and six pivot quick start, we use them to sort a list of less n. So when n is large enough, finally, the six pivot quick start will, uh, all, will outperform the five pivot quick start. But for a real world application, the best strategy would be that we adjust the number of pivots when the length of the establish varies. And for one pivot we start, it might be interesting to see whether there's any sampling method for the pivot which can significantly improve the efficiency. So uh, finally, let's look at Peter Bokwin's problem. So what is Peter Bokwin's problem? Um, it asks for the maximum number n such that it is possible to place n white queens and n black queens on an n by n chessboard so that no queen attacks the queen of the opposite color. So here are some nice pictures uh, from articles by Dr. Stone. This is one of three solutions on 5x5 five five board, a solution on 8x8 eight eight board. Can, can I say something? Yes, yeah, sure. No? Yes. I didn't make those pictures there. Those pictures were made by Michael Deflieger. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, because uh, these pictures are on your article, so I saw you made them. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, then this is more general construction uh, by Juby, but actually uh, in uh, a book, in 1987 by Andy, I think uh, he already proposed this construction. And so far, only 50 turns are known. So here's our strategy. We want to consider this principal queen's problem as a continuous problem by normalizing the chessboard to be a unit square then uh, we define the W to be the region where, where white queens are located. And then the non-attacking region B of W can be defined as follows, and B can be the region for the black queens. So we want to find the subset of W such that it maximizes the minimum of the area W and the area of uh, black queens. And here's our observation. Uh, the queen is able to move any number of squares vertically, horizontally, and diagonally. So uh, W should be a convex polygon or a distributed union of convex polygons whose boundary consists of vertical, horizontal, and uh, so plus one, minus one line segments. Because otherwise, we can increase the area of white queens without decreasing the area of black queens. So it means each component is at most an octagon. 
So uh, this one is the Cubans construction. Uh, we want to prove at least this is a local optimum. So we use the data structure for the vertices points. So uh, we can see there are two pentagons, and then it's not difficult to find the region of dark green and the area of white and dark green. Then we can set in the two areas equal, and then using the branch multiplier, we can find all the extreme points. So uh, we find the coordinates of these two pentagons for white queens and similarly for black queens. So the maximum area of this configuration is 7 over 48. So now we want to uh, consider the maximum area under more restrictions for white queens. So for example, what if the white queens are in a single rectangle? So this one is easy, we just need to get the coordinates of white queens, find out the area, then the largest area is one nice. Then again, how about white queens are in a single parallelogram? This one uh, has exactly the same answer with uh, the previous one. And how about single triangle? So it's, this one is also easy. So how about the largest area for a single component? So because we already know it is at the most octagon, and to minimize the non-attacking area, it should be placed in some corner, so say a lower left corner. Then in this case, it is at the most a half octagon, because you can notice that if, if it's an octagon, it will be a waste, because on a lower left corner, it should be uh, like a right angle. So let's find out the maximum when it is a hexagon. So uh, generally it looks like this. So we consider the general shape of a hexagon, find the area of white and black queens. So we find the local maximums uh, using the range multipliers. So this is one of the local maximums, but this is not a hexagon actually. This is an optimal triangle with an area of one x. So this one, when A, B, C, D are equal, uh, this is a maximum area for a single hexagon. So uh, in next step, uh, we want to consider that uh, the white queens have two components. In this case, we need a cylindrical algebraic decomposition because we, uh, we can use them to find out the exact optimal all parameters and the maximum areas. So say, what if there are two identical squares uh, for white queens? So now we have two parameters, one is the side length, the other one is the coordinate of uh, this point. So we have two squares, then based on this configuration, we need to find a domain of the parameters A and S. It's not hard to find the area of white queens. But the formula for black queens is very complicated. Especially when A is very small, there may be a lot of components for uh, black queens. But here is why experimental mathematics is important, because from experimentation, we found that for some mid-range S, A around 0 0.23 will always maximize the area. So with this information, we just need to focus on the shape of black queens when A is not far from its optimal. Then we have the area of black queens. And since in the area of black queens we have the max function, so we want to separate the domain uh, into four regions. In each region we have a polynomial formula for the area of black queens and the white queens, then we set them to be equal. Now here we need to use a cylindrical algebraic decomposition. So for each Situation, uh, we can find A in some branch, then S can be given as a function of A. So from this result, we can find the maximum area uh, of white queens because in this case, it only depends on A. 
So then uh, we find the maximum area when there are two identical squares. So similarly, we can find the maximum area for two identical isosceles right triangles with the same orientation. It's uh, smaller than the previous one. Then uh, when, they, uh, have, when they have opposite orientations, actually we don't need the CAD. Uh, in this one, it's easy, it's one place. And when uh, one of them is a square, the other one is an isosceles right triangle uh, with the same size length, we still need to use uh, CAD. So uh, this one is uh, larger than uh, two identical squares. Okay, so finally, uh, I'll have a summary. Uh, this is a picture from Pi Day homework of experimental mathematics class in spring 2018. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>